How are we doing? Can you guys hear me? Come on, I, we're, it's not 9 a.m. anymore. We're 11 o'clock. It's time to get live. Let's get after it. How are we doing this morning? I am incredibly encouraged by what God is doing on this campus. I showed up at 845 this morning. I saw lines outside the door. I saw a bunch of hungry hearts. Just They could not wait to come in here and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Could not wait to come in here and, and just embrace and experience what God has for them. But there is, um, like Jake said, I, I have played in the National Football League for the past five years. Uh, about two years ago, my brothers and I started an orphan care organization. Right now, we are primarily located in Haiti. And one of the best things about running a nonprofit is I get to lead mission teams, vision teams, whatever you want to call it, to Haiti, groups of people. And, you know, Talking with Jake, I was extremely excited to come out here, extremely excited to come out and to see the next generation, see the next wave of influencers, the next wave of world changers. But then I started to think about it, I was like, wait a second, this is a missions conference. So when I think of missions conference, I think of the most ugly shoes I have ever seen in my life. What is it about missions and chacos and missions and sandals and missions and Tom's shoes? What is it about that? So we have one rule at our house. When you come to Haiti, if you come to Haiti, you are not allowed to bring Chacos. That is not allowed in our house. I don't know what this correlation is to where, okay, I'm gonna go do Jesus things, so I have to now wear Jesus sandals. Is that how, we're, that how we do it? No, I wear tennis shoes, I wear chucks, I wear what I wear here in my daily life. And so um, that's why I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be here so that I can breathe in the freshness and the ability and the aspirations that you guys have, but then also turn that around and challenge you a little bit. Also flip that around and maybe change some of the paradigms you may have as far as what missions are like. Um, like Jake said, I have a different perspective, right? So I have lived what you would call the American dream. I have achieved the pinnacle of my, of my profession of the National Football League. But I can tell you, that life in the NFL pales in comparison to life of living a life of Jesus. Life in the NFL pales in comparison of all the money and the fame and the fortune and all the accolades and success pales in comparison to holding a five-year-old orphan kid in Haiti. That's why I was created. That's why I'm on this earth. And so today I'm going to jump, jump into... Uh, Luke 19, and for those of you familiar with Luke, Luke 19 is the story of Zacchaeus. And I love this story. I love this story because it, it emphasizes that there is power in one person who positions themselves to experience Jesus. There is power in one person no matter their past, no matter their platform, there is power in one with the power of one. Starts with verse one. Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was of short stature, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here, I, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house because of you too are a son of, a man, a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I'm gonna pray real quick. Father, I come before you as a humble man. Lord, as your servant. Lord, I ask that you would just fill this place with your love, with your spirit, with your grace. Lord, rain down the riches of your mercy onto these people. Father, I just thank you for my new friends. I thank you for the ability to come together, God, in union and in celebration of what you are doing. Father, you are alive. You are victorious. So Father, we declare that over our lives, that you are the sovereign one. You are the protector. You are the rescuer of orphans. You are the freedom 
that we seek and that we cherish, Father. So God, just pray right now, Lord, as we dive into your word, Lord, that we would have attention with intention, God, that we would apply this to our life, that it would be applicable, that it would be a transformation, that it would not fall on deaf ears, God. I pray you would open hearts, Lord, that you would expose hearts, and that you would encourage. Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask that we would just be in awe of what you're doing. In your name we pray, amen. So, um, when we started this organization, when I started this organization my brothers, I wanted to, I was ready to set the world on fire. So when we started it, um, our main goal was to care for orphans. It's like, sounds pretty simple, right? Let's just go and love on orphan kids. Let's go and take care of kids who don't have a mom and a dad. Let's give them a home and let's just call it a day. Let's see what we could do. And uh, it's, 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 it's a pleasure for me because one of our staff members is actually here. He's the one repping our shirt. He's all geeked out in IME gear and he's the one hanging out here. And so uh, he could attest to this. He was actually there at this experience. And it was about, uh, it was last June actually. And we were, we, we had a mission team over in Haiti. We we're leading them around. You know, when you have missions, it's like you're scheduled. You go from here to there to there to there and you're running around all over the place. And it's just, we want to give you a brief glimpse of what God's doing and also find a way to expose what's going on in your heart, but also find a way to maybe get you out of your comfort zone a little bit and then see maybe some things you're capable of that you didn't know. Maybe experience something in, in, a, in a different perspective that God is doing that you've never seen, maybe because you're so comfortable in this space. That's why I believe in the beauty of missions. That's why I believe in that aspect of things, of getting out of your comfort zone and opening your heart and just saying, okay, God, here I am. Do with me as you will. And we're shuffling around. I remember one person specifically, and this is not me. I am very free-spirited. I'm very easygoing. I'm just, I am, you should see my planner. I mean, it's just craziness because I'm just not organized. I'm just not structured. It's not who I am. I am just an easygoing, spirit-led individual. When God tells me to go left, I go left. If God tells me to go right, I go right. Now, I'm not saying discrediting the other way. That's just for me. So we had a girl on our team that was the exact opposite. And sometimes opposites don't attract. And I remember specifically, we were at a, um, like a little youth camp opportunity. My brother was actually speaking to about 15 teenagers, teenage Haitians. And one of our Haitian staff members comes up to me in the middle of the service. And he says, um, hey, I just got a text message from somebody that lives in the area down the street. And she says that there's five orphan kids on the verge of death. And of course, for me, I'm like, well... I'm leading this team, we have plans, we have meetings, we have to go certain places, we got this, we got that, we got things, these things going on, but you just told me there's five kids on the verge of death. Like, what is that about? Like, how do you ignore that? How do you not, okay, what, tell me more. And so I gather our team around and I start to get a consensus. I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily asking for their approval, but just making sure they understand what's going on. Hey, I just got this call. At this point, we didn't have any kids. We kind of only been in Haiti for like six months. We didn't really know what was going on. We were just, just couple of dudes and a couple of people just trying to have fun and kind of see what God, where God leads us. And we start to talk to them and we're, we're telling them, hey, this is the situation. We don't know anything other than we got a call. There's five kids on the verge of death. Um, it's about 20 minutes from here. We don't know where, where, what it looks like, what's going on. But, you know, this is kind of something you should explore, right? Am not crazy saying that this is something we should probably go out and see if we can help? And <laughs> one of the girls, bless her heart, uh, was so schedule oriented and so she was all about, okay, this is a mission trip. I am here to do things that I came here to do. I came here to build a church. I came here to um, put on a program and lead 28,000 people to Jesus. I came here to do this. I came here to do that. And it was just, and I was like, okay, if that's what you came to do, then there is the gate and I can call another organization that can come and pick you up and they can go over there and do that. I didn't say that. but. So, long story short, I'll keep going. We got in the car and we decided to go. We decided to go. And the whole time she was asking questions like, where are we going? Like, what is, what, what is that? What is this? What are we doing? The whole time, I mean, my brother and I, if you know my brother and I, we're just, we kind of have like an unspoken language. We can look at each other and be like, this girl is crazy. Like, what is going on? What, what happened if we just dropped her off and just left her here and we took off? Like, now it's five kids on the verge of death. We got one American who's by herself. Like, what is all this about? And so, we, we were driving over there and she's just all asking so many questions and it was just all about this, be compliant honest with you, it was, it, was, it was from a spirit of religion, to be honest with you. It was from a spirit of doing. We have to be doing something. We were supposed to be doing something. We're supposed to be, I'm here on a mission trip. I'm supposed to be building and leading people to Christ and, and, and 
evangelizing and making disciples of the nations and being the hands and feet of Jesus. And so we get to this place and we get to the uh, place where we found, that we heard the kids were on the verge of death and we get there and it wasn't anything like they explained. Am I lying? I mean, it was nothing like we, they explained. It was basically a Haitian run orphanage. Um, it was, from what we have found out, it was the middle party between sex trafficking. The girls would come there, the girls would go to sex trafficking, the boys would come there, and they would be sold off. They call them in Haiti, they call them Restivex, like child slaves. This is kind of a halfway home to where this woman was kind of, you know, we don't, can't prove it yet, but a pimp. And there was over 45 kids there, and it was the most disgusting, despicable, inhumane living conditions I have ever seen in my life. I have traveled the world. I've been to India. I've been all over the world. I've been to Sierra Leone. I've been to Ghana. I have gone to places, and I've slept in tents. I've slept on the floor. I haven't been hunting lions like my man Matt earlier, but I have been around the world. But I've never seen something like this before. And in the midst of all this, the same girl was asking all these questions, was, was, just kept saying, what are we doing? What do we do? Like, what, is she a, like, what is going, why are they going, are they going to prostitution? I don't like this. There's too much spiritual warfare. There's too much uh, going on. It's just, it's, I feel like there's a lot of darkness. Like, these kids, they got, they got pee all over them, and they're picking rice out of their urine, and they're, you know, this kid has pink eye, and that kid has uh, something all over his head, and maybe this probably, kid probably has tuberculosis. Don't touch him. Don't touch him because you're going to get tuberculosis. It's passed through the air. Whenever it, she had all this data, I was like, wow, you're really smart. You could probably help us if you would kind of just stop talking so much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we get to all of that, and, and my brother and I are like, what is going on? I mean, it was that, it was that we are in the thick of it. Like, this is what we were called to do. We were there, like 45 kids, we can't take all of them. We had a house, two bedroom house. We had 10 Americans there with us. And so we started to pray and we started to ask God, okay, God, what is this? Because we first started that thing, this thing. We said, you know, we will not be goal oriented. We will not be mission oriented to where we are so driven towards getting to a goal or getting to a purpose that we miss out on the journey. You know what I mean? Or that we become so mindful of getting from point A to point B that we forget to celebrate what God is currently doing right now, or that we become so driven to say, okay, we're going this way, and then halfway through, God's like, ah, actually, I want you to make a right turn right now. You know like those bad navigators that tell you to make a right turn like a mile after you pass the exit? That's what we wanted to do, and we felt in that moment a sincere um, epidemic of peace that we were in the place where we were supposed to be that we had created this organization for that ex specific moment, and that if we, we almost did, if we had all of our eggs in one basket, and in this basket over here, there was no way we had a capacity to take these kids. And so, to further go, prove that point, the girl who was with us actually knew a lot about our organization, knew a lot about you know, our financial situation, knew a lot about our housing situation, and kind of the history of who we are and what we're doing. And the whole time, well, you guys can't afford to do this. Like, hold on, David, you're tw at this time I was 27. You're 27 years old. You play in the National Football League. You don't know anything about taking care of kids, especially kids from a traumatic standpoint, especially kids who have this instance and this example. And this kid was, you can just see it, was beaten and had bruises all over her face. And especially with that kid. Who are you to say you can do this and take care of these kids? No, we need to get out of here. We need to go and do what we can do, which is go and preach the word go and pray for people, go and build things. That's what we do as Americans. That's what we do on mission trips. That's what I came here for. <laughs> and so we start, again, we start to pray. My brother and I start to pray. We're like, what is going on? Like, God, what do you have for us? If this is your will, please make it known. If this is what you have for us, make it known. And so and Ryan was there and a couple of our other staff were there and it was just overwhelming. We're like, we get, this is what we're doing. And so we found, you know, it wasn't like we walked through, like I said, you are poor, you're the poor, get out of here, you poser, you're not poor, get out, get, you're poor, you're sick, you're sick. It was more of like, we actually had a doctor with us and it was more of the kids who were literally on the verge of death. I mean, a couple of them were, uh, the doctor gave them maybe 24 hours to live. And so for a couple of them, we took them in with the notion of saying, we want to give them the best quality of life they can possibly have for the next 24 hours. Um, that's how bad they were. It was like the commercials you see on UNICEF, and you see like the Sarah McLaughlin of the dogs and everything, and the really bad, uh, I almost, almost saying it, but I'm glad I didn't. Um, seeing it, uh, that, that's, what, that's what these kids looked like. And so for us, 
it was just like, okay, there's no way we can see what we've seen and walk away and just say, okay, sorry. No matter what my circumstances are, no matter what my capacity is, there's no way we can do that. And even people who I thought would tell me no on our staff or maybe on our volunteers or maybe on the mission team besides that one, they were all on board too. And so we identified nine kids at that time who were on the verge or in a bad situation because you know, we, we'd be doing more harm than good, if that makes sense, to bring in the rest of the kids. And so we were trying to figure out a way to bring those kids in, immediately get them, get them nurtured, get them cared for, get them uh, as much attention as they can possibly get, and then maybe we can find an organization that can care for them because we didn't know how at that point. And so we, did, we started to do this, and we lowered all these kids in the bus. I mean, this bus reeked. I mean, because I reeked. I mean, these kids were I mean, literally bathed in pee and, and I'm not even going to use the other word, but just vomit and just, I mean, it was just oh, so bad, so bad. And it was so bad that now that because they were on me, it was now on my clothes, and now I smelled like that. And then now everybody in the car, I think we had nine people, and I think we had nine kids, so every ki- person had a kid, and they were hugging them, and this, these kids had no idea what was going on. Like, why are these white people taking me, and what's going on? Like, what are, who are you, and why do you have glasses, and what's, what is this whole thing? Like, what is this music? Is that air conditioning? It's kind of cold in here. What is going on? And it was just so chaos. And then we looked, my brother and I looked at each other and, and, and it was just, some of the kids were crying. Some of the kids were, you know, they were speaking Creole. And at that time, I didn't know how to speak Creole. None of us did. We had some translators. And they just kept saying, I'm, ho- I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. Who are you? And then the kids who wouldn't speak, they wouldn't say a word. They were just so. But what was interesting about that, I've talked, to different, I've talked to different police officers, I've talked to different law enforcement officers, and they always tell me that 80% of the time, whenever they go to a child um, abuse, or they deal with something, or they gotta take, physically take the, cut, the kid away from the parents because he, the kid's been abused, they said 80% of the time, that kid falls asleep within five minutes of being into the police, police car. Because for the first time, he feels safe. For the first time, he feels uh, welcome. For the first time, he feels um, that he can be at, at peace. This was true for us. Five minutes into our drive, of the nine, probably seven of them fell asleep. For a lot of them, you could tell it was the first time they'd slept in over a week. For a lot of them, you could tell it was the first time they had actually fallen asleep. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you kind of sleep with one eye open or you kind of halfway sleep and your body's asleep but your mind's still awake. For the first, I mean, it was just like out. I mean, they were limp, <laughs> out. And we get to the house and we start to clean the kids off, we start to bathe them, we start to, you know, we're calling all kinds of people, seeing what we can do, and start calling, you know, different entities and different organizations and NGOs saying, what would you do? How can we do this? Is there a doctor in the house? Like, what can we do to help our kids and get, get these kids the best, whatever we can do? And in the middle of Patrick and I running around and everything going on, we ran downstairs, and the girl who the entire time had been telling us not to do things, had been, you know, discouraging us from doing things, talking about going this way when God was telling us to go this way. We get down there, and I look at her, and she is <laughs> literally, and uh, it is a Bible example, but it is lit- she was weeping over this child, weeping, her tears were ca- coming down, this kid was asleep in her lap, and she was using her hair to wipe the mud off the kid's face with her hair. And she looked at me, and she goes, what is this? What is this love that I'm feeling right now? And I looked at her and I said, I'm not gonna say her name. This is what we do. That is what we do as followers of Christ. We love unconditionally, fearlessly, intentionally. We love. The reason why I love this story about Zacchaeus is because it talks about in, in, verse, um, in verse seven, it says, look, look, look at this guy. Like, so the Pharisees are looking at this situation. They're going, look at Jesus. Look at him going eating lunch with a sinner. Look at him going, and then who's that little short man that he's running around with and taking him? Like, that's, a, that's a tax collector. For those of you who know your, your scripture, know, know, tax collectors were the worst of the worst. They were the, and he, it even says he was a chief tax collector. So that means he was in charge. So he was the, the number one offender. And he was also wealthy. But what I love about this story is it says that they looked at him and they said, look at Jesus going to eat lunch with a sinner. I am grateful that Jesus had lunch with a sinner just like me. This proves to me that no one is too far from grace. 
This proves to me that, that no one is too far from the power of Jesus. That the most unlikely of stories, the most unlikely of people, the most uncharacteristic, most unappealing person, Jesus called out in a crowd of thousands, called out and said, Zacchaeus, I see you up there. I want you to know that I see you. Because you've positioned yourself to experience the savior of the universe, come down from that tree. And he, you know what's funny about that? He didn't say, hey, okay, now go clean yourself up. Or now go and do Hail Mary 10 times. Now go and do the rosary 15 times. Now go and uh, serve the homeless, go and travel the world. Go do missions first and then I'll come and see you. Then I'll come and be your savior. Then I'll come and give you grace. He said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to meet you right where you are. And as a matter of fact, I don't want you to come to me. I'm coming to your house. It's not, hey, you know, maybe meet me for lunch later. Hey, maybe come and do this for me. It is come down from that tree and I am coming to your house. My man, Jesus invited himself over to his house. I don't know if any of you have friends like that. I got one sitting in the front row that just invites himself to my house all the time. I got to constantly keep my refrigerator loaded with Diet Coke. And I don't even like Diet Coke. And it's just, but I love you, man. I serve you. I love you. I'll do that for you. <laughs> Jesus juke. Hashtag Jesus juke. The other aspect, the, the most powerful point of this story, and I love that, that Jesus didn't listen to they. He didn't listen to the Pharisees. He didn't listen to, uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that my brother and I and the rest of us, we didn't listen to the Pharisee spirit that was coming out of that girl that was speaking to us about don't do that, you can't do this, this is a mission trip. You guys can do that when I leave, like right now, this is about us, we're on a mission trip, I gotta get something out of this. I haven't experienced Jesus yet, the Holy Spirit hasn't captivated my heart, isn't that what mission trips are about, when you're supposed to like just set on fire? And I'm so grateful he didn't listen to them. But the most powerful point of this story is that it talks about in verse eight, it says, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now I give half of my possession to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus not only accepted grace, Zacchaeus responded to grace. See, a lot of times as Christians, and, it's, and I'm speaking to myself, when I was a Christian, I was baptized in eighth grade. I heard him speak about David Nasser earlier. I was baptized because of his poetic beauty. I was at Falls Creek in Oklahoma City. David Nasser spoke. I listened. <laughs> I accepted Jesus when I was in eighth grade. I accepted grace. I was a consumer. I went to church. I went to youth, youth camps. I was, the, I was on the front row even. I was a consumer. I accepted grace. I used the cross as a parking spot. I had gotten there, mission accomplished. I am good to go. Check it off my bucket list, I'm going to heaven. My eternity, I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. But as scripture tells us that the cross and that, that a relationship with Jesus is not meant to be a parking spot, it's meant to be a catapult to a life and to a life more abundant. And in this instance of Zacchaeus right here who understands, you didn't see Jesus say, Zacchaeus, like I said, don't, don't, go and change yourself or in order to follow me, um, I need, Zacchaeus on his own accord came to Jesus and said, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. Whatever I've stolen from people, I will restore it to them fourfold. And then Jesus goes and says, because of your faith, salvation has come to this place. Three different people were impacted because of one person's decision to follow and obey Christ. What happens when we decide to walk in the fullness of what God has for us? A domino effect occurs. A domino effect that a lot of times we can't even see. A lot of times we can't see the fruits of our labor. But then the, uh, here's, here's what I want you to hear. Now this is what's different about my, percept, by my perception of missions. Here's what's different, is that responding to grace is great. That accepting Jesus into your heart is great. And we angels rejoice and I welcome you as my brother and sister in Christ and I welcome you to Haiti and I hope we can live long and prosper lives and I hope we can do great. But it all means nothing if it's not out of love. It all means nothing if it's not from love. I have scripture to prove it. First Corinthians 13. If I speak in tongues of men or of, or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Verse three. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I have gained nothing. If I give everything I have to the poor, if I give up my NFL career 
if I give up my life and sacrifice everything, but I don't do it out of love, I have nothing. What, is, what, is, what does Jesus tell us about the three? Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Faith, that'll be realized when we get to heaven. Hope, that'll be realized when we get to heaven. Love is eternal. Love transcends, it breaks barriers. It breaks communication barriers. It breaks differences. I have gained nothing. Zacchaeus positioned himself and found a love that he could not deny. Found a love that was different, that was different than what we experienced between a human interaction. He experienced what, what they call agape love, which in translations means an unconditional love, which means I don't care what you do, I will love you. I don't care where you go, I'll love you. I don't care if you go to Haiti, if you go to Africa, if you go to Biola, if you go to University of Florida, I will love you. But then, what, what's next about that story is I love, and specifically about the people of Corinthians, and he was talking about that. Corinne, I'm getting all mixed up right here. Is that, the reason why Paul is coming to them and talking to them, and we use this, 1 Corinthians 13, we use it in um, marriage seminar, we use it and we frame it and put it up, and love is patient, love is kind, and we make it this, be this, this beautiful poem. But if you look at scripture and you look at you research and you look at the theologians, you look at what the base, Paul is angry. Paul is talking to them and saying, wake up. You're doing all this, you know, yeah, you have all the bells and the whistles. You have the great church services. You have a lot of people showing up. You do, you do great community, community work. You get involved in the community. You, do, you go and do service. But there's no love. You're not doing it because of, of, of the love of Jesus it says that if a faith is small of a mustard seed and you can move mountains. And Jesus is saying, you're trying to move, you're trying to be a mountain mover and you're not having faith in Jesus. You're not having faith in me, the one who moves the mountains. You're trying to be a co-laborer with me. You're trying to do this with me. Get out of my way. Let me do what I do. And I gotta be careful how I say this because I love you guys. I love the school. The little I know about it. I love everything about it from what I've heard. But I'm gonna tell you this right now. Just because you go to a Christian school doesn't mean you're a Christian. Just because you go on a mission trip doesn't mean you're the hands and feet of Jesus. Don't, don't get that confused for a second. Just because you're at a mission conference, just because you come to a mission school doesn't make you a missionary. Just because, you, just because you come to a football game and you cheer and you, <laughs> you come to a game and you cheer and you laugh and you cheer for the, I don't even know what teams around here, San Diego, San Francisco, doesn't make you a part, doesn't make you a part of that victory. Just because I'm on the sidelines watching and saying, hey, good job, guys, what's going on? Good job, I'm proud of you guys, and then I'm gonna go celebrate like I did something. No, I'm on the sideline. I need to be on the field, contributing. And that's what I, I see the most, the stigma that we're trying to break as far as, just because you're in a church doesn't mean you're a Christian. We exist to be beacons of love. The beautiful thing about a painting is that the painting's job is to reflect the masterpiece of the creator. We are blank canvases of the King of kings, the lamb of lambs. Our job is to reflect the radiance, the beauty, the joy, the hope, the love of the Father. But for whatever reason, for some time, not everybody, and sometimes we choose to limit that. And a lot of it, and just like my, Matt, my man Matt talked earlier, he kind of stole a lot of my stuff. A lot of it, because we don't know what makes us different. We think that the fact that we don't go out to the clubs, or we don't go to this, watch this bad movie, or we don't cuss, that's what makes us different. I'm here to tell you that's not the truth. Now, don't get me wrong, continue to do those things. But what sets us apart is the agape love, the connection, the access that we have to the Heavenly Father at any time we want it. The ability to walk in freedom, the ability to walk in purpose. Jeremiah tells us that before we were born, that 
that God intricately wove us for a specific purpose. That tells me that you were not created by accident. So who are you to doubt yourself? When you doubt yourself, you're doubting the ability of the, of the creator. If you doubt your ability, if you doubt your opportunity, if you doubt, I don't have a platform. I don't, I'm not a, David, I'm not an NFL athlete. It's easy for you to say, what's going on in Haiti, what we're doing and what's going on is in spite of me. I'm telling you that right now. It's in spite of the NFL platform. Because I had people tell me, you won't, you won't, you can't do it. Who are you to think you can lead a nonprofit organization? And it's funny now, because people who know me back then are laughing like, there's something going on. Look under the hood, because I know you, and I know you could not do something like that. There's something different going on. I want to see it. I'm like, come on. I have nothing to hide. Because when you open that hood, you're going to see Jesus. You're going to see the Holy Spirit. Because... Uh, I love the, the cliche calling that God doesn't call the perfect, he perfects the called. And in the story of when Jesus feeds 5,000, I love the aspect of the boy who walks up, and I can just imagine, I, just, I love picturing, I love like, kind of like mind um, time change where I go back in time and like picture myself standing next to Jesus as the boy walks up to him and gives him five loaves of bread and two fish. And I guarantee you that all the people around him were laughing at him and saying, what, is, what are we going to do with that? It was 5,000 men. It doesn't even say how much women and children were there. Just 5,000 men. What are we going to do with that? And I don't know if any of you, I'm, I mean, I, I'm kind of skinny right now, but I like to eat, and so I can probably eat five loaves of bread at, at Carabas by itself, and that, that's not going to fill me up. I'm ready for my pasta. I'm ready for the main course. That's not going to fill me up. And what I love about that is that the boy knew, and I can't speak for him, but I picture he did, that he knew that in his capacity, in his dimension, and in everybody else who was speaking to him, it, what his offering was limited, but by offering it to Jesus, it was not limitless. Scripture tells us that our lives are a living sacrifice to offer our lives to him, to give ourselves to him for his will and not for ours. I have, cannot tell you how many times I have heard people say the prayer, your will be done, not my will be done, singing the song, Hosanna, break my heart for what breaks yours. But you know what? I've seen him break people's hearts. So what now? What's next? Break my heart for what breaks yours. Your will be done on earth as is in heaven. But, is, but can we wait until I'm married? Can we wait until I have kids? Can we wait until I have you know, a career, money, a platform, influence? I've achieved something first. Can we wait, God? Like, that's not what... I know I said that, but I was really kind of just kidding. I didn't think you were gonna take me at my word, like, right? Like, come on, like, we have a joke, like, we, we can laugh at each other. God's saying, and specifically to me, because he had to humble me. I'm speaking straight from, I'm, can I be real with you guys? God, I'm a, I'm a sinner. God, I used to, I'm a, kid, I'm a guy that was involved in the wrong things. I was, I was going to the club. I was pursuing women. I was pursuing money. I was pursuing fame. Everybody knows that about me. Who's going to take me seriously? They're going to know those things. Who am I? I'm 27 years, when, we, when he called us to lead this ministry, I'm 25 years old. God, I just, I just had the best year of my life in the NFL. I'm about to get a big contract. Can you wait until then? I promise you I'll give you 50% of it if you just give me a bigger contract maybe. I think I'm bargaining with God. He's like, no, but David, you, you, for like 20 years now, you've been praying, my will be done, and, and you've been praying, and, and I am here to tell you, and Christians, hear me out, and non-Christians, hear me out. When are we gonna stop praying out of things that we've prayed for? When are we gonna stop praying out of things that we have been longing for, we've been praying for? I'm telling you right now, who are you to determine what's best in your life? Like it's yours. Did you pay it? Did you pay for it? Did you put your life on the cross for it? I don't think you did. I hope not, because you're, you're sitting here and I can see you, and that'd be really weird. I'd be kind of creeped out. He paid it for you so that you could live a life of abundance. It is for, as Galatians says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm and do not be burdened by the yokes of slavery no longer. Now, we think of slavery as like physical dimension. I see it as a spiritual and emotional dimension. Doubt is slavery. Fear is slavery. Because you know why? Those things don't exist in heaven. Fear doesn't exist in heaven. It tells us when we get there, we will be rejoicing. We will be celebrating. Angels will be playing trumpets. Hearts will be playing. It'll be peaceful. It'll be joyful. It'll be a celebration. 
So, so whenever, you, whenever you feel that feeling of anxiety or doubt or fear, I'm telling you, it's coming from the enemy because he knows you're onto something. He knows you're about to tap into something great. He loves to strike whenever it's the closest, when you're on that bubble. He almost got me. Actually, he got me a couple times. <laughs> the third time I finally woke up. I said, no, I want all of you, God. I don't want to kind of dip my toe into the water. I don't want to kind of see if it's okay. I love that song where it says that we're no longer slaves and he parted the water so that I could walk into it. Now he parted the water, now I gotta walk. And, I, and, and don't get it twisted, I love, I love, yes, we were called to obedience. We do need to obey. But you can obey, I could have said, okay God, I'm gonna obey you and I'm gonna start this nonprofit, I'm going to be a father for the fatherless, I'm going to love and try to give as many orphan kids as I can a better life and a, and a family. But obedience can fall. A week later, I'm like, this is not fun. It gets hard. It's hard. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's, it's fun and it's fulfilling, but it is hard. I've had made a lot of sacrifices. There's a lot of, of what we do that is hard. Ministry is hard. Walking as a Christian is hard. I don't want to ever sit here and discount, say, okay, well, as soon as you accept Jesus and you become a missionary, it's sunshine and blue daisies, it's rainbows and lollipops, and you're going to be a great person, and I'd be doing you a disservice because you're going to get hit in the face. You're like, Whoa. What was that? They didn't, he, didn't, he didn't warn me about that. I'm trying to give you the Ephesians 6 mentality of equipping you with armor so that whenever something comes, you're not reacting, you're responding. You're not re- reacting from a position of weakness, of depletedness, of emptiness. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. When something comes at you, you are ready to respond. Whenever I got released, I'm, I got released this year, um, week seven, I hurt my, hurt my foot, and they traded for Percy Harvin, who's actually a teammate of mine at Florida. Of course, you if any of you know football, Percy's one of the best receivers in the league. So when he came on, I became a back thought, and so they released me. Uh, somebody called me and did an interview with me, and was like, well, how do you feel? You know, what's going on through your head? And I responded with what I just told you. What do you mean, how do I feel? I'm, gonna, I'm taking it today. Today is today. I'm going to walk in the fullness of what God has for me. Just because I, I play football, does, it, does that make me, does that define me? Is that my identity? Yeah, that's a bad situation. Yeah, I'm not happy about it, but I'm not gonna lose my joy over it. I'm not gonna lose my purpose because of it. I'm not gonna sit there and doubt my authority as a leader of an organization or doubt my authority over what, the, as, as a son of the king because I no longer play football. Like, that's an earthly possession that, for all I know, God is just moving out of my path to propel me to something bigger. So I walk in expectation. I don't know about you guys, but I walk in expectation of what God's gonna do. I love the story in, 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 in the Second Kings where it talks about the three kings who came together because the Moabites were attacking them. And the three kings who had never worked together, and it says that there was a famine. For seven days, their soldiers had no water, they had no food, they had no ability, they, had nothing, they couldn't eat anything. So how can you go and take on the Moabites, which was, in that, at that time, a very powerful army, so powerful that three separate kingdoms had to come together just to defend themselves. In seven days, they hadn't drink, they hadn't eaten. So they go and they seek out the prophet Elisha. And they ask Elisha, what is it? God, we know you have the word of the Lord. We know that God speaks to you, so please, can, you, can, you give, can we speak to you so we can have his ear and say that we need water. We need food for our, for our servants, for our um, soldiers. And so Elijah, you know, I'm speeding through this. Elisha tells the, the kings, you'll have your water, but it won't come by wind nor rain. You know what that tells me? That God had just delivered a promise and he'd given the provision, but he's saying it's not gonna happen the way you think it is. Think about how in those days, how you got water. It was only really through, through, through rain. They didn't have like those big water towers. They didn't have like the ability to go and like water well and pump it up like you know, some of the great organizations do. It was pretty much right only through rain. And so this prophet is speaking to these three kings and now the three kings are sitting there like, wait, we're supposed to go back to my, oh wait, I skipped something. The most powerful point is that he says, now go and dig an expectation of what God is going to do. It's not gonna rain, and no wind's gonna come, but you will get your water, but you have to get your shovels and go dig for the water to fill so the water can be where God is saying it's gonna be. So can you imagine those three kings? Like, well, I can go back and tell my thirsty soldiers who are about to go into battle, probably to die for their cause, that they now have to pick up shovels to dig a hole in the ground for water that's not gonna come by rain. And I'm encouraged by that because you know what they did? They did it. And you know what's cool about that? Is that the more they dug, the more room they made for God to bless them. 
I love the, I love the image that we, we see and we talk about whenever a woman's pregnant, we say she's expecting. Because when a woman's expecting, what happens? You go and you, ma- you, go, and do a, you go and you build all kinds of stuff in the room, you get baby carriages, you're, you're dreaming of what's gonna happen, you're making room for the blessing that's about to come. You're expecting. As sons and daughters of the king, we are t- to walk in expectation. We walk from victory, not towards victory. As I pray that God is alive. We are the brides of Christ. We are here to be beacons of love. God's saying, I don't care about your accolades. I don't care how many followers on Twitter you have. I don't care how long you've been married. For me, I don't even care that you started a nonprofit ministry. Because so many times we confuse corporate growth with personal growth. Like, man, my church is growing. Man, my organization is growing. Man, my family is doing great. So then we forget, like, whoa, since by process of elimination, if my church is doing good and growing and going deeper and being filled, that means I'm being filled. That's not the case. It's a personal relationship. And God's like, I don't care about your service. I don't care about your football career, the money you've made. I care about love. I care about loving you. Stop moving. Be still. Let me love you. Stop trying to do all these things and think that as a Christian, and the Christians are the most busy people I've ever met in my life. Some of the most unhappy people I've ever met in my life are Christians. Because we think, of, you know, <laughs> you go to church and you're like, hey man, how you doing? He's like, oh my gosh, I've been so busy. I've been, I've been running around serving the homeless last night and you know, this morning I woke up and uh, I went and walked a lady across the street and then some old lady across the street had her cat in the, 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 the tree and I went and saved the cat. And, and then I, I went home and I made pizzas for the homeless and then we went and I took my kid to the, to the barber shop and that's not really a service but my kid just needed a new haircut. And then they get there and it's like, and I just you know, I went, did you know, Hail Mary's five times and I went last night and I was just singing, oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and I lost my voice because I was just screaming so loud. <laughs> and then they get to church and the same person that's putting their, heart over their, their hand over their heart for, at a sporting event, same person that's declaring their heart to their country refuses to put their hand on their heart, put their hands in the air, whatever it may be, an act of surrender to the king. He'll go to a football game and he'll put his hands in the air and he'll root for people he's never met, grown men cheering for other grown men and wearing their uniforms, whatever it may be, walking sometimes five miles to get to the game, parking because he wants to save $10 to walk into the game. He's got his face painted and he is decked out because it's his his team. He's team Chargers, he's team 49ers. That's his team, it's a part of him, it's it's his blood. Yeah, we're, we're there. These are my buddies, I've never met you before, but we're gonna high five because we just scored a touchdown, right? We're, we're, we're buddies. And I'll never talk to you again, but we're good. And then we score a touchdown, we put our hands in the air, we're celebrating, it's good. But then that same person, when you get them at church, they're... And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with not putting your hands in the air, I'm not saying anything like that. But I'm saying that there's a disconnect there to where we celebrate people and we celebrate what people do and we celebrate the accolades and the platform. We celebrate these professional athletes and these entertainers and these people, but we somehow miss out on this, the, what God is doing through a single mom who is living in the suburb, suburbs of Detroit who has been taking 20 kids to school who don't have the transportation and she doesn't have money for gas, but she takes them to school every single day. We don't celebrate the woman who... Um, has no money and, and is making ends meet and is nickel and diming her way and is at church and hears um, a youth pastor say, hey, we got this kid we can't afford to go to the youth camp. It's gonna cost $250. If anybody would be willing to sponsor him, it'd be, we'd really appreciate it. And she steps up and walks up there with her quarter roll and her penny roll and, and says, hey, can I write a check but can you not cash it for a week because you know, I gotta put some stuff in there. And then starts talking to the youth pastor and says, hey, I don't, I don't know who this kid is, but I, I really feel led to, to sponsor him and to say you know, that you matter. I know that he doesn't have money and I don't want money to limit what God could possibly do in his life. And if I could be of any service and any kind of um, spark to that, then that's what I wanna do. That's my story. I was that little kid who couldn't afford to go to church camp. A single mom walked to the front of the stage, had never met me before, walked up to the front of the stage and offered all that she had. 
And I guarantee you there's people in the church that were laughing at her. She pulled out the little penny rolls. I guarantee you there's people in the church that were like, wait, what is she doing? I just, I spent the past three weeks with her managing her money and telling her to spend it more frugally, to, to save and to invest. And now she's given the, all she has to, you know what's funny about that? I'm still trying to find her. I've never talked to that woman a day in my life. I pray for her every single day and I thank God for her. But what's amazing about that is that that woman never got to see the fruit of her investment. But I know that woman didn't need to. Because just like Zacchaeus, she responded to what God was calling her to do. And she said to us, $250 is limited. To, to us, $250 is, you know, that's only, we only do so much, but in Christ, and we talk about domino effect, because of that one woman's offering, one woman's sacrifice, thousands of orphans around the world will now have a home, will now have family. Because of her ability to step up and say, okay, I want all of you, Jesus, and I'm willing to give up whatever I have to the betterment and to the investment and to the growth of some other individual. I didn't even accept the Jesus. I accepted Jesus on that trip. Thousands and hopefully hundreds of thousands of orphans. I've led people to Christ because of that woman. I don't know if I ever would have. There was a moment, a divine moment in that time where God said, here it is for you. Are you going to receive it or are you going to reject it? And we all have those moments. I had that moment when we were at the rescuing those kids. Our life is to be, like, I love what David Pratt says, Platt says, is that we don't rescue because we're rescuers, we rescue because we have been rescued. But as citizens of heaven, as brides of Christ, as sons and daughters, it's what we do. We promote love. We elevate life. We encourage, we equip, we challenge, we communion together, we communicate with each other. Jesus, now don't get it twisted, Jesus was a friend of sinners, but he was a companion of sinners. What does that mean? Know who you hang out with. It talks about bad company corrupts good character. It's love. My identity for so long was an athlete, was being a football player, was being a whatever the world wanted me to be. I was the best at being who you wanted me to be. I was that chameleon that could just, okay, what does this person want? Okay, I want him to like me. I was seeking um, your affirmation. I'm seeking your confirmation. Whatever it may be, I wanted your attention. I wanted you to like me. And it really broke my heart when somebody said something bad about me or somebody didn't like what I did. And the biggest thing I could ever do was disappoint somebody. And I was so busy, like I said, we're so busy doing all those things of, of church and going and serving and we do so many things and we miss out on the one thing, which is Jesus. I guess I was so busy doing all these things, like I have to do this, and I have to do that, and I do that, 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 that. And I think a lot of times the enemy, if he can't get you to do a lot of bad things, I firmly believe that he'll try to keep you busy doing a lot of good things so that you're distracted from what God is really trying to do. And I love the verse in scripture, it's my favorite verse, because I have to constantly remind myself, because I'm always traveling, going around, the, going around the world. The verse that says, be still and know that I am God. The life, my life quote for since I was baptized and it just didn't resonate with me until about three years ago is, is you know, in, in paraphrase, what good is it for a man to gain the world and lose his soul? What good is it to gain the world but not love yourself, not value yourself? Jesus died on the cross for you, and so by you not valuing yourself and knowing that you matter, talk about the great I am, the I am is a state of being. I am means the state of now. It's the state of like it's not like okay, future, then, past, then. It's now. It's I am. It's a state of being. It's, a, it's an omnipresent Holy Spirit. Our organization is growing. It's growing. It's it's incredible to me. It's an encouragement to me. And like I said, it's like, whoa. You know, like if you get, I hope I don't know if you I don't know if you have like dogs or I don't know if you can allow dogs here but if you like nieces or nephews or sons or daughters whatever it may be and you, you're there with them every single day and you know the, you, you're cleaning up the poop and you're having to, to train them and you know discipline them and then your like sister or somebody comes like wow she's getting really big and you're like what are you talking about like, she's been pooping all over the place like you're so in it so in it that you can't really see the growth you can't really see the difference 
that's kind of where I am now with the organization, with our organization. We, I mean, we're getting office space, you know, we're bringing in kids, we just opened up a school, I mean, we're partnering with Tom's, we're partnering with all these amazing organizations, and it's just like, what is going on? How, how does this happen? What is going on? But like I said earlier, it's not about obedience, because I could have obeyed and just said, okay, it's about commitment. Commitment, in my definition, is the longevity of obedience in the same direction. It's gonna get hard. There's gonna be trials, there's gonna be persecution. But you know what, Every, anything, I promise, anything you want in life is gonna require commitment. Marriage, I promise you it's gonna require commitment. A career, relationships, relationship with Jesus, it's gonna require commitment. And what I love about when you accept Jesus into your heart, it's like when you propose, like men, when you propose to your wife, and you get in on one knee, and this is big, elaborate thing, which I don't know how we even got to that, I don't know how we got to this big, elaborate proposal. I watched a 15-minute proposal on YouTube the other day, I'm like, wow, this is so extravagant. I gotta live up to this someday? Like, what is going on? <laughs> and when you get down to the knee and you propose, and you say, babe, whatever you guys say nowadays, <laughs> bae, is it bae now? <laughs> bae. <laughs> I think she's gonna walk away at that moment, like, forget this, I'm not marrying this guy, bae. You know what I'm talking about. And you're on the knee, and you, say, you ask your wife, to, your girlfriend at that time, to marry you. Now, she doesn't say, one second, and go and jump on a flight, and go and fly around the world, and look at every man in the world, and say, no, 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 no. I wish, <laughs> no. <laughs> If you would have been here two years ago, yes. But she doesn't do that. She makes one statement. Yes. And no to every other person. When you say yes to Jesus, you're saying no to everything else. But then when he gives you this grace and he deposits, says that he deposits the Holy Spirit in your life. Now you can just receive it and take it. You can be a consumer. You can just sit there and be like, okay, David, thank you for that word, it was good, I'm gonna tweet you later, maybe I'll come to Haiti with you, maybe I can go and help you guys in some way. Or you can start contributing. It says that we were all made to be parts of the body. If you're a hand, be a hand. Because I'm telling you right now, I need you. I need you. My kids need you. Because what happens if, if I'm being a hand, and you're supposed to be the left hand, and you're not doing your job, now I have to overcompensate and I can't operate in my skill sets. I can't operate in my anointings and my giftings that God has. And it even says here that if, uh, if you use your giftings but it's not a love, then it's for nothing. And as our organization is, if, it, if we grow, and I'm constantly keeping myself in tune with this, that I wanna make sure that we keep the main thing, the main thing, which is Jesus, which is loving people, just serving people, instilling hope and freedom into people. And if it becomes, at the moment I feel like it's becoming a production, you have my word, I'm gonna shut it down. I love that song by Matt Redman, The Heart of Worship, and the heart of the background of that song is the church was growing and the pastor said, okay, this is crazy, we got all these lights and stuff going on, it's a big show and people are coming here for the worship and people are coming here for the pastor and not necessarily for the word. They're coming here because they get comfortable seats and they get great coffee and it's just checking it off. So he says, we're gonna shut it down. And we're gonna go meet at the homeless shelter instead of meeting in here. And then that, church went down from 5,000 or 20, however much it was, to cut it in half. And he said, next week we're going to go into the tunnel and we're going to do it there. And it went from however many they had and it cut it down again. And it says that I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. It's all about you. I'm going to Haiti because it's all about you. I'm going to start a nonprofit because it's all about you. And if it becomes a production, if it becomes about me as an NFL athlete, if it becomes about my brother or about the Americans or even about the kids, if it becomes anything about that, I'm going to shut it down. I'm an ambassador of love. I'm an advocate for freedom. The moment it becomes a production, I am shutting it down. If love isn't at the center of it, then you don't have the beauty of Jesus. I promise you, you want all of him. I've seen some powerful things happen, some things you would never believe. And as I talked about with the kings, he's saying, go dig your ditch. The, fir the more you dig, the more water you have. So I challenge you, make room for the Holy Spirit. Give God room to move. Stop limiting him in your life. Stop saying, 
okay, I'm gonna be in control. This is my world, this is what I'm gonna do, and now, okay, you can come in halfway, and then I'm gonna do some other stuff because, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. You, are, you, you created me, I should know what I'm doing. To give him room to move. To give him room to, to dream. To maybe even expose you. How about we pray that one time? God, expose me. Expose me for what I have been following, the idols in my life, the relationships I'm in, the, the dreams I'm chasing. Expose me. It's gonna hurt. What happens when a surgeon cuts open and he's gotta pull out things you know, in order to get it out? There's, there's a process and there's a, it's gonna hurt. It might even be embarrassing. But in the long run, you'll be better for it. This is to cut off the vine that doesn't bear fruit. What happens when you cut those vines and you get those weeds? What gives room for natural grass to grow? The beauty, the actual natural, what's supposed to be there, it gives it room to grow. What if I, organization, and for those of you who are followers of Christ, what if we've stumbled upon the hope of the world? What if we've stumbled on the key to eternal life? What if we've stumbled on what it really means to be a follower of Christ? I love Paul and his example because he's saying, if that's the case, and I believe it is, because I've experienced a love that has transformed me, not an experience, a love that has transformed me, and I can't stay silent about it. I want the world to know it's gonna be hard. I'm gonna lose friends, I'm gonna lose popularity, but it's gonna be hard. Paul's saying, I have the anecdote. I'm saying, I have the anecdote. The truth is sitting right here. And I'm telling you guys, I know you know, and it breaks my heart, because you know someone right now that's got a needle in their veins. I know someone right now, kids who are sleeping on the street by themselves. And I'm not saying that to guilt you. You should never feel like, okay, I need to be guilted into serving and to loving people. But what if you were created for that purpose of that person? To save them, to take that needle from their arm. To donate $250 for a kid to go to the youth group camp. What if that is what you do? I'm gonna close with this. I met a boy when I was in Haiti, and that's kind of what started this whole thing. It wasn't anything that he gave me. It wasn't anything that he asked of me. It was that in the moment of everything that was going on in his life, he wanted me to hold him. Didn't know he was going to eat, didn't know he was going to sleep, didn't know, he was gonna, didn't know where his family was. Didn't know if he was going to be alive in 24 hours. But his greatest need in that moment was love. His greatest need was to know that he mattered. For five minutes, somebody hold him and say, you matter. So I encourage you guys, let's live a life beyond ourselves. Let's live a life of deeper meaning. Let's live a life that's not about us. A culmination of ones, your story, you matter, you matter. You know why you matter? Because you were created. He wouldn't create you if you didn't matter. He gave you dominion over the earth. He gave Adam the dominion to name the animals and, the, and the, everything on the earth. He's given that to you, it's at your disposal if you'll respond and commit. Let's live a life beyond ourselves. Let's live a life led, stemming from love. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for my friends. I thank you for just the ability to come together, God, and just seek uh, what you have for us. Father, we don't have all the answers, but you do. God, you don't make it known to us, and that's okay, because we trust you. Because you are the mover of mountains. You bring hope to the orphan. You are the rescuer, God. And we abide in that. Lord, we rest in that. So Father, I pray for all these individuals in here right now, God, that are seeking, that are looking, the God, that have questions. I pray that you would place somebody in their lives, God, that can love them, that can serve them, that can equip them. I pray that there is somebody wanting to go deeper. God, you give them the courage. You would download upon them the ability and the courage to go and to seek. And Lord, I just pray for this campus. 
I pray for Biola University, God, I pray for what you're doing. I pray that you would just continue to transform hearts, God, that this would be a hub for some powerful awakening around the world. Father, I just pray for this community, I pray for these individuals, these world changers, God, that you would equip them, you would show them they matter, that they have the I am inside of them. They have the power of Jesus inside of them. And so, Father, I pray as we leave here that we'd walk and follow you and love you and love each other. Let me pray. Amen. Thanks, guys. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.